I believe that Jesus's ministry was primarily directed towards the poor. And as part of his uh, focus on the poor, um, he gave a lot of teachings and, and, and messages that sort of warned or cautioned his followers or disciples about their desire to acquire wealth and their desire to acquire more material things. So if I may encapsulate the belief, it is that, would we say that this Jesus' primary message was associated with how we treat the poor, or is it, tell me more, like, I'm trying to understand, like, in a sentence or two, what the belief is. Yes, so the belief is that, yes, Jesus' uh, primary message uh, concerned um, our ability to take good care of the poor. And, uh, and, and, and to know that the poor have a special place in God's heart. Uh, and as part of that message, he also had a lot to say about um, how our desires for more, our desires for wealth, uh, fundamentally affects or impacts uh, our relationship with God. So are we saying that Jesus favored or favors the poor over the wealthy? Is that what we're saying? Well, I think, I think that, you know, the biblical witness is that we are all created in, in the image of God. Uh, but when you, when you start with the Old Testament and you read the Hebrew Bible, uh, you begin to note that from start to finish, God is always uh, calling on his people to, to take care of those among them who are vulnerable and marginalized. It is always this cluster of what I call the cluster of the vulnerable or the cluster of the marginalized, widows, uh, aliens or foreigners among you, the orphans, uh, and, and the poor, uh, people who uh, often will find themselves in a, <clears throat> in a position that sort of their, heart, their lives become very difficult and very hard because of whatever position they find themselves in, whether they are orphans who've lost their parents or widows who've lost uh, uh, a spouse or uh, a, a foreigner who is visiting your your land or, or the poor, God is constantly calling his people and giving them laws to sort of look out for these people and to take care of them. Uh, and Jesus's ministry also sort of continues in that, uh, uh, in that train, something that starts from the Old Testament and he picks that up and continues with that uh, uh, in the in the New Testament so as well. Yeah, we can say that Jesus's primary message was to look out for the poor. Right. And what would you say your primary reason for that is? What what if you someone? What's your best reason of why that is Jesus's message? Good, that's a great question. So maybe I should talk to you about a little bit about my journey, how I got here. Um, so, um, well, my primary reason for come into this place is through my study of the scriptures. Uh, so I'm a, um, I'm a biblical scholar by training. And uh, a few years ago, I was invited to be on a, on a panel um, to sort of uh, discuss my book, but more than, my, more than that, my first book. So my, I wrote my first book on what we call the powers, the powers in Paul, that is this notion that there is a world beyond our world. Um, and and there are these spiritual forces out there that sometimes, um, you know, they have intellect and will, and sometimes they um, affect things that are happening here. So I was invited on this panel to sort of expand our knowledge to how that <clears throat> relates to <clears throat> the notion of poverty. Uh, and this was mostly my first book was on Paul's letters. So this was uh, Practices of Power in Paul's Letters. So, how are the powers related to Paul's thought? And, and as I was researching for that uh, interview, something really struck me. And that was the notion that <clears throat> the early Christians took for granted the fact that Jesus was poor, right? I mean, so you can, um, it's, it's not something you hear about <laughs> much today, um, but you, you can imagine walking into an early Christian church, right? A church from the first century. And they will be singing this hymn that 
uh, you find in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, uh, it's a hymn that says that, it, it's a hymn about Christ, and it's, it says that even though he was in the form of God, he did not um, regard equality with God as something to be gra- grasped, but he made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He took on the form of a slave, mm-hmm. and he was obedient uh, being in human likeness, he was obedient to death, even death on a cross, right? Well, well, let me just, so we don't get sure. too far ahead. Right, right. Uh, uh, on a scale from one to seven, sure. how, how confident are you that this belief is true, would you say? I would say 6.5. Sure. Fairly confident. <laughs> Very 6.5, and on a scale yeah. from one to seven, how important is it for you to believe in true things, things that are true and real? Seven. Okay. Yes. And it seems like the primary reason why you have the belief is if it comes from the scriptures, exactly. I think. If Tanya, let's say, is sitting next to you, right. and Tanya is happens to be wealthy, yes. and Tanya, for whatever reason, doesn't give to the poor, right. and Tanya considers herself a Christian, right. and Tanya... She looks, she reads the scriptures and she finds evidence in the scriptures that the way she's living her life and the, she's wealthy and the reason why she's wealthy, let's say she thinks that she's blessed to be wealthy oh, yeah, we can talk about that. and yeah. she doesn't give to other people. Right. What would we say about Tanya's belief? Good. Very good. I would first acknowledge that um, um, the biblical witness is diverse in how it approaches this subject of wealth and poverty. So the notion that wealth is a blessing from God is in the Bible, mm. and I will I will acknowledge that. Um, so starting all the way from the book of Genesis, you know Genesis chapter one verse thirty one, where God says that it says that God saw everything He had done, and it was good. This is an affirmation of material creation, uh, and it's a, an affirmation that the world around us, uh, material world, is not evil; that it is good. Uh, there was a, a time in early Christianity where there were a group of Christians um, whose beliefs were that the material world was bad, and they were called Gnostics. Uh, it's a, this belief called Gnosticism, which is that <clears throat> material creation is evil, and it wasn't. It was created by an imperfect God, and that salvation consists in escaping this material world. And the Christians sort of pushed back and said, "No, actually." That's heresy. That is, that this is not the teachings of the church. The teachings of the church affirms Genesis 131 that the, that the world is good, creation is good. And also, as part of that teaching, you get things like Deuteronomy 8, where material blessings uh, are from God, that wealth can be a blessing from God. However, I would say, alongside that notion that, you know, um, Bless that your wealth is a blessing from all God, or your wealth can be a a, um, a blessing from God. Alongside that is also other teachings that 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 blessing comes with lots of warnings and warning signs. So even even in Deuteronomy chapter eight, where God talks to the Israelites about you know I will bless you if you would follow my laws and you'll be prosperous in the land, right? There, there's always that warning that comes with this wealth that says, but be careful because once you attain this wealth, you there is a kind of confidence that sets in where you feel like you are quieted by yourself and that you are a self-made person and that this wealth can turn your heart away from God. So right alongside this notion that wealth is a blessing from God is also this warning, warning that comes with it that says, um, Actually, this stuff, you have to be very careful with it because it can turn you away from God. So I'll say to Tanya, for example, I'll say to Tanya, if indeed it is a blessing from God, which is the teaching that you you, you are um, talking about, then blessing means it's a gift, right? That's what blessing is. Yeah. So if it is a gift, if you receive something as a gift, why is it so hard for you to yeah. share and give it away and, 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 and bless other people with it? Sure. And if Tanya... And she goes on to believe the belief that right. that uh, that God wants her to be wealthy, right. and uh, and and God's okay with her not sharing her wealth. Right. And you, of course, believe that uh, God 
um, or Jesus aligns himself with the poor. Right. If I'm a third person, I just want to know what's true, what's real about right. the situation. Exactly. How could I, is there a way I could find out? Is Absolutely. there a way? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so let me, so let's keep going with the train of thought that I was sharing with Tanya, right? Mm-hmm. That um, this wealth comes with warning signs yeah. that, that, that come with it. So, um, I think a very good place to, to look at is, um, and, and here I'm still, we haven't even started talking about Jesus yet, uh, but let's still stick with the Old Testament for a little bit. Um, the Israelites find themselves in slavery uh, in Egypt. And while they are in slavery, um, God sends Moses to come and rescue them. As if there's this very interesting part of the story that always strikes me. Uh, which is that right before they leave, right before the Exodus, right before God rescues them, when the the Egyptians say to them, leave, because now all of our firstborn sons are dead. The Israelites go to the Egyptians and ask them essentially for their treasure. (laughs) And the Egyptians basically give it to them, uh, which the biblical writer seems to imply that this is God's punishment on the Egyptians for what they've done to the Israelites is that they... Uh, the Israelites are able to take away um, wealth or treasure from them as they as they leave. So they take all of this with them, and then they get into the wilderness. The Israelites, I mean, get into the wilderness. So they leave Egypt with treasure, mm-hmm. and they get into the wilderness, and obviously they face hardships. Things aren't going very well. They're looking for something more. Moses goes away for a little bit to get the Ten Commandments or the commandments of God. And when he comes back, the people have made a golden calf, an idol uh, that they are worshiping. Um, Now, you have to ask yourself, they are in the wilderness, right? Where did they get the the gold to (laughs) to make the golden calf? It's the very blessing that God had given them when they they left Egypt, the treasure that God had given them, that they had turned that into an idol. So the warning signs are there, right? So, right so we're speaking beginning. about the, the, this is a derivation from the blessing of exactly. God. Exactly. So are we saying that this belief that you have, mm-hmm. that Jesus is aligned more with the poor than the wealthy, right. is this belief dependent on Jesus being a God, of being a su- of supernatural uh, importance, or could Jesus just be a person, and that belief still rings true? Okay, so as a biblical scholar, I always so you were asking for the evidence and where you go mm-hmm. and affirm that. I would say read the Bible, uh, read it closely, and it's there and it's everywhere. So, so then, um, um, so let me so let's go to a particular passage that I think will get to really what you are asking at right. So there is a passage of Jesus' encounter with this wealthy man. There's a rich man who comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to to 27. Uh, And it's a very interesting passage because the rich man comes to Jesus and asks him, uh, he comes, he says, good teacher, Mm -hmm. what can I do to have eternal life? Yeah. Uh, And Jesus says to him, why call me good? Uh, Well, more he says, only God is good, right? Um, And there... There's a very interesting thing that's going on in the passage because the man calls Jesus good teacher mm-hmm. and Jesus says only God is good. So in a sense, he's affirming, Jesus is affirming here that um, he is God because the man has called him God and only God is good. So he's saying to the man, why call me good unless you've acknowledged or recognized that there is some relationship or or I share in God's good nature in, in some way. But, right? but, but does this make a, the belief make a difference whether Jesus is a God? It does, or... and that's where I'm going with this. Okay. It, it makes a very big difference. So that encounter, and it's it's, it's a very interesting story because he says to uh, uh, the, the rich man, he says, you know the commandments, you know, mm-hmm. that shall not steal, that shall not defraud, um, go and keep them. And the man said, I've kept all of these from when I was a, a youth. And Jesus says, Jesus loved him. And then he says to the man, go and, yeah, you lack one thing. Um, go and sell all you have. Give the possessions to the poor and come follow me. Uh, and the man went away sad uh, because, according to the text, he had many possessions. He was wealthy. 
Uh, so Jesus's command to go and give what he has to the poor was very difficult to him. Now, why why is this important? It's important, uh, and it ties into the question you're asking me because. The text presents that story as a call story. What I mean by a call story is that Jesus says to the man, not only does he tell him, go and give away your possessions, he says, come follow me. So it is a call story. It's a, call, it's a story about discipleship. And it's the tension in the story really builds when you come to recognize that Jesus has already give, given the man a hint that he is God. <laughs> because when okay. the man calls him good, he says to the man, only God is good. So in a sense, I share in God's divine nature. Okay. Now, this is where things get really, really important uh, in this story. It gets important because as a reader of the story, you have to ask yourself, this is a direct call from God. If Jesus is telling the man that I am God, it's a direct call from God to, to go and sell your possessions and to come follow me. But the man walks away. And why does he walk away? Because he's, in essence, pledged allegiance to another God, right? That is, um, Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Wealth is sort of like a, a God, in a sense. The man has pledged allegiance to this God. So it's really hard for him to let go of that allegiance and to, and to come follow this other God who is telling him to, to come okay. follow me. So I think it's a very... It's a very serious um, story when you think about why this man fails. Right. Well, I, and to, I'm sorry to, 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 to yeah, cut you yeah, off, and, yeah, then, keep going, and I'd yeah. like this to be more of a of a dialogue oh, between okay. us two. Yes, go ahead. Yes. And and um, and so I think what you're saying is is that the belief is dependent on Jesus being God. Sure. And and uh, again, I'm sorry to, to cut you off there. Uh, I like these to be conversations sure. where we're trying sure. to, sure. you know, understand the belief sure. better. And sometimes it helps if I, it helps clear my head if I can ask a question sure. or two, and then sure. I can figure out what what uh, better what you're where you're coming from. Um, if if Tony, let's say, believes in uh, instead of the scriptures, he follows the Quran. He believes in Allah. Sure. And and let's say, and I'm not sure how this is addressed in the Quran. I really have right. no idea. Right. If the Quran let's suppose doesn't mention this or doesn't mention this about poverty and uh, how that is al aligned with God near as much as the Bible does. Right. Um, could we say that both beliefs are true? Well, so what I will say is, no, I'm not a Quran expert. Yeah, uh, neither am I. Yeah, and I and and I, but I, I do, I, I do know that there are teachings in the Quran about taking care of the poor and and yeah. and, and also watching your wealth. And, yeah, and I, like I would that. imagine, sure, sure. But I think that, um, at least for me and where my standpoint is, I think that this belief is much more pertinent. And much more important for those who claim to be followers of Jesus, right? Uh, in other words, uh, if you claim that you are a follower of Jesus, if you claim that Jesus is Lord and Lord over your life, then it it's important that you listen to what he's saying, everything he's saying to you. And, and one of the things he is saying to you is that, um, one, you, God, the God of Israel cares about the poor. And so if you follow this God you also have to care about them uh, in, in some way. So I think it's very important um, how followers of Jesus um, uh, um, apply this message uh, to their lives. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then. It, let's say somebody follows the message, has the message right. that we should help out the poor right. and it's the right thing to do right. and, and, and we need to help out the poor. Right. And, um, and let's say that they have no belief in God. Right. Where, where do we say that belief is coming from? Well, I think you would have to ask each individual why it is that they are doing it. Um, and I think that, you know, this is why we have um, lots of nonprofit organizations that are devoted to uh, helping or, or, or helping people who are dis yeah. disadvantaged. Yeah, if, so if right. we can help the, right. the poor and have the belief and help the poor and not have the belief, right. what, what does the belief do? Right. Be, how, and, and the belief that Jesus right. wanted this or wants this, and, it's, and the primary reason for this is the scriptures. Right. If, if, 
people can act and behave in this way, I guess is what I'm getting at, right. without the belief. Right. What, what does it say about the belief? Good. So, so again, we're going to have to ask those people who don't have those beliefs why it is that they do what they do. And different people will have sure. um, mm-hmm. different reasons for why they give to the poor. For yeah. all you know, somebody's doing it to get a tax write-off or yeah. somebody's doing it for um, uh, other reasons. But And not to impugn the integrity of what they're doing. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you are a follower of this God of Israel and if you are a follower of this Jesus, then it's not an option. Right. So the person who doesn't have that belief, right, might decide I may want to help the poor or I don't. So people who do not have the belief right. don't. So people who do not have the belief have the option to help the poor or not help the exactly. poor. Exactly. And people who have the belief that you have exactly. don't have the option okay. not to help. I exactly. See it is it is it is a core of your belief. It's it's, it's fundamental to what it is that you if you're a follower of Jesus, then it's not an option. Yeah. Uh you you're going to have to you're going to have to care about the poor and to and to help them. Now if somebody's not a follower of Jesus and they don't care about the poor, that's fine. But what I'm saying is if you say you're a follower of Jesus then this ought to be a part of your belief, and this ought to be a part of your faith walk. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. yeah. I think I think yeah. I understand right. that. It seems like this belief is contingent on Jesus being a god. Okay. If Jesus was not a god, would you still have the belief? Well, if Jesus was not a god, then I probably will not be Christian, <laughs> right? So, um, so it's. It it it's a belief that comes from my. Are own. you saying that you wouldn't help the poor if you didn't have this belief? Well, I I think that um, no, I I'm not I'm not implying that there aren't people who are in help, helping the poor, and this is why I was trying to clarify your question. There are people who are helping the poor, yeah, and it's come it it they may have so many other reasons for doing so, but what I am saying is that. We ought to be supporting that as as followers of Jesus. Um, it's that um, because the, it's core to our belief, right? It is central to our belief. So if you if you're a follower of Jesus and you see someone who is not a follower of Jesus helping the poor, then it's a great opportunity to partner with that person and say, "Look, uh, you may be doing this for other reasons, and I'm a person of faith, and my faith." Um, demands that I, I do this. Can I partner with you? Or I'm also doing this and you're, you're doing this. Is there a way we can partner uh, together as well? So I, I applaud those who don't have any faith and uh, who, who help the poor. And there are so many people out there who do that. And that's a good thing. And I, but, I'm, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that for those who are believers and followers of Jesus, we also ought to be doing this. And, and if we can find opportunities to even partner with those who aren't believers, uh, it, this is a core, core belief for us, and it's core to our faith, and we ought to be doing it. So I just want to make a distinction. You're saying that people who follow Jesus ought to do it or should do it. Right. Do people who follow Jesus do do it? Is it, is it something that it is, we could show that it is part of the belief system? And it is a tenant of the belief? Good. I, I would say they do, but they don't do it enough. <laughs> so, and this is part of why um, I am... If, if we were to run some experiment, let's right. say, and we took a thousand, I don't know, atheists and a thousand Christians right. at random. Right. And, and I have no idea how this would come out. Right. right. But it, and we measured the percent of wealth each gave to the poor. And right. if it came out, let's say that atheists gave twice as much as... Christians, for whatever reason, would you still have the belief? Do you think, or would you? Yeah, would you... I would. I still would. I would. I would say it's unfortunate uh, to, if we had a situation like that. Yeah, and I'm just uh, be- I have no because, idea how that come out. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yes, because I do think that for people who are very serious about their faith, we ought to take these teachings of Jesus very seriously um, in his in his call to to not only assess our own relationship with material possessions and wealth, but also in his call to take a, to, to take good care of those who are marginalized, the poor, the widow. You know, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, he says, the, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Well, you I know? guess what I'm saying is that if there are right. other belief systems, and not just atheism, it could right. be any other religion, 
that let's say if you followed that belief system, you would find yourself even more aligned with the poor, let's say. Sure. Why have your belief system then? Why, why would not switch to a different belief system? Well, I don't see why you should switch to um, to a different belief system. I'm because if, in essence, there are other belief systems out there, and there are so many of them, right? Mm-hmm. And um, who are also calling for us to to take care of the poor, in addition to what I think Christians ought to be doing, right? Then I think that if everybody is really doing what their belief system is telling them to do. And I think the poor would be in a much better shape than they are in our society. Yeah, and, um, I, it, and I think that it absolutely yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And, and, and I think I'm just really trying to get to the core of the belief here. And I'm, I don't mean to, to pepper you the questions, but I'm right. really trying to understand that I, I see that the, the belief is very important to you right. to help the to belief is, is that in the Bible there are uh, passages that show that Jesus want you to help the poor, and it's this fundamental message. Right. And I'm trying to see that if that message was obtained even more so elsewhere, some other religion, let's say, we're we'll, going we'll to make up a religion, we'll just right. uh, call it uh, uh, this chair religion. Right. If, if, if there was a chair religion out there right. that, that said, basically, we need to give all our money to the poor, right. and, and basically, all of our work needs to be Right. surrounding helping the poor, even more so than Christianity. Right. Would you then change to that new belief system? Or is it, it, is it you have the belief system because, because you believe in the Christian God, and if you didn't believe in the Christian God, then you would just have a, a different belief system altogether, and you might not be helping the poor. Right. So I, I think I'm trying to finally get what it is that you're getting at. Right? Okay. So I think that the the the... Christian system or the Christian belief, it's it's not it's it's more than just one thing, right? There is there is more to it than just helping the poor. I I think that helping the poor is an essential part of it. Uh, but there are people who who are Christians. So if this says something different right. in the scriptures, then you would still be a Christian and still be and still believe in Jesus. Sure. But but you might not necessarily help the poor as much if it didn't say it as much. Yeah, but I also think that if that were the case, right, the scenario that you were describing, then I think the God of Israel will be an entirely different God, right? A God of Israel who did not call his followers to take care of the poor or who did not call his followers to be like the poor, I think the Christian system would itself be an entirely different because the entire system is based on um, a belief in a God who created the whole world, who calls his people out of slavery. Exodus, the Exodus story that I told you about is so important. Here are people who are in bondage and God goes and rescues them. And by rescuing them, he's saying that he is a God who is there to help those who are in bondage, those who are suffering, those who are marginalized. This is the kind of God he is. And we also find out that this God sends his only son, which is the core of the Christian um, yeah. belief. And when he sends his son, you know, there's this interesting passage, not only in the Philippians 2, 5 through 11 uh, passage that we talked about, where it says that Jesus was in the form of God and yet he came and he took on the form of a slave. What does that mean? Well, in the Greco-Roman class, slavery is the lowest class you could ever be. They're in the bottom of society. They're in the bottom of the system. And that's what Jesus did. Second Corinthians 8, 9, it says that he became poor for our sake. So the kind of God we are talking about, right, that is the Christian God, the God of Israel, yeah. the God who is the father of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He couldn't be anything else other than a God who cares about the poor and those who are marginalized and those who are suffering, because that's what he has revealed himself to us to be. So, so, so I think what you're telling me is, yes. is that, yes, the belief comes from the scriptures. Exactly. That if we go even further, right. the reason why the belief is true is because the scriptures comes from your belief in Jesus as God. And even more than that, it's, it's, it's also grounded in the belief that the God that we serve mm-hmm. has revealed himself to us, to us as a God who rescues those 
who are in bondage and suffering. And he showed that to us by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, to enter into our own condition of suffering and poverty and marginalization and to die on the cross. So what I'm saying is that and, and, if and there if, was... If Tony yes. has that belief. Right. Like, and Tony believes that, that helping the poor is the right thing to do. And right. I know that's a should statement, but, right. but helping the poor... Between the choice of helping the poor and not helping the poor, right. helping the poor is a societal goal. Right. And he doesn't believe, Tony doesn't believe in a God. Right. What does that say about then the fundamental belief that you have, Jesus is God deriving the belief of the scriptures yeah. and that belief being true? Right. Well, I would say, obviously, I've never been a Tony. <laughs> so I don't, I would have to sit out with a Tony and find out what Tony's aims are. You said are you've never been a Tony? What I mean is that I've never been somebody who would, who has not had faith, right? I've never been a person of faith, so I couldn't put and, and myself And by faith, in, what do we mean? I mean belief in, in God and belief in Jesus Christ, right? I've never, I've never done that. So faith I, means belief? Faith meaning putting your faith, yeah, putting your trust in God as someone and putting your, your trust in Jesus uh, as someone who can who can save, deliver, rescue, redeem, all of that. Um, and you so, said you've never been a Tony. That, that, yeah, what that means is that I've never operated from a position of non-faith, right? So, and, 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 if, and Tony says, I have operated from yours. Right. And, and, and Tony says, why haven't you considered my view? Right. What would um, you tell Tony? Well, I'll, I'll tell Tony that um, I don't see any reason to give mine up. <laughs> Right. In the same way that I'm, I'm, I may not maybe judge you for not being on my side. Um, I, I don't I don't see because because it is who I am. It's part of my identity. Um, and I I believe this and I live it out. And uh, and I think it's true um, uh, to to live to live this out. So um, I don't want to overlook um, um, what what. Tony Zhu, or to overlook the point that there are people of non-faith who may practice yeah. charitable deeds. Um, but what I want to say is that, and the point I want to hammer is that for people of faith, people who follow Jesus, it's not an option. It's part of who you are. If Tony decides that, okay, I'm tired, this job is too hard, I want to quit. If Tony quit. says that it's part of who he is, this is how he was raised and is. He goes back generations and gener generations, and we've all done this. My whole sure, family have sure, done this. Sure, And it's part of his identity. Sure. And he says, I am doing this without faith. Right. And, and you say that you're doing this with faith. Right. Why the faith? Why? And he says... He doesn't need it. He says, you do need it. I'm trying to understand why, where do we need the faith at this point? Yeah, for? well, I will be, you know, we're engaging in a lot of hypotheticals. I would be interested to to talk to, uh, because we can uh, yeah. compound possibilities upon possibilities upon possibilities. And I think what's more important is relationship, right? That is... Well, the, the very strict, the very right. straightforward, pro the very straightforward uh, scenario is that he doesn't have the belief in God, and he functions how you function. That's, that's fine. That's it. And, and I think that, so the, the point I would make is that if Tony decides to stop at any point, okay. caring about the poor, helping the poor, mm -hmm. um, there is really no reason for Tony, Tony stopping, and there's really no accountability. Tony can switch it on and off. So you, need, what, you need God to... for a person to consistently do good things? No, I'm just saying that I'm just saying that um, if Tony decides not to do it anymore, right, why not? I mean, wh wh who is there to ask Tony, you know, wh where is the accountability or why did you stop? Why are you not doing this anymore, right? But for a person of faith... Well, uh, Tony's perspective... Right. Tony thinks that whether there is accountability other than someone else from him, right. his point of view is that, well, that would be impossible. Why? Because, because from his point of view, right. he doesn't have a belief in God. So to say that there's a God accountable for, for him, that doesn't, even, that, that doesn't make sense to him. That's the point. And that's exactly the point I'm making is that 
So he can switch it off at any point. That is that he can stop caring for the poor at any point. He can decide that I'm that not going to do this work anymore. That he thinks you're doing, mm-hmm. you're doing what you're right. doing. You might be doing something wonderful, but the but the epistemology of it, the reason behind it, you're doing it for a, a, a false reason, according to Tony. Well, I won't say it's it's a false reason uh, because I think that well, because a God is saying for you to do this. Right. right. Um, so, um, in the same way that I will not, you know, uh, question his motives for why he's doing what he's doing, right? Um, I, I, what, what I'm concerned about is relationships, is that if the goal, Tony, is to help the poor, yeah. right, then we can partner and work together to do this. And I don't, I don't really care where he's coming from. Well, and I right. understand that. Mm-hmm. And I'm just taking... I'm using the reasons why you're using. I'm really trying to understand why you believe the belief. My belief, because my belief is grounded in this God of Israel and Jesus Christ, his son, who comes and enters into our, our, our condition of, of poverty and suffering, it's not enough to just give money to the poor. It's more than just giving money to the poor. You have to get to know them. You have to enter their condition. You have to form relationships with them. You have to do more than just throw, throw money at them. So my approach, perhaps, might be different than Tony's approach because mine is grounded in a belief in a God. So, so we're thinking that, that yes. Tony's approach, we're assuming that Tony's approach is to give money and not to form a personal relationship with I'm, people. I'm not saying that because I don't know Tony, yeah. right? Exactly. You're going to have to bring Tony to me yeah. and let me sit out and talk to Tony. I think that when we create these hypothet- hypothetical scenarios, well, everything is possible. I, I, well, and we can yeah, compound is... possibility upon possibility upon possibility. But, yeah. Right? And, and, the, 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 and I want to get to the core of reason why I'm doing that is right. not just to throw <laughs> hypotheticals at you, yeah. is, to, is, to, is to generate... A belief system, in this case Tony's, right. where he can, let's say, mirror someone who you would think is Christian. Right. And let's say you didn't know he was an atheist. You didn't know someone else was a Christian. You didn't yeah. know this person was an atheist. You didn't know this person was a right. Christian. Let's say you didn't know their right. beliefs. Right. And based on their behaviors, right. you couldn't separate it out. Like, these people do great things and help the poor, and right. these people don't. And... And the the belief they follow, uh, you couldn't predict it. Right. Well, I think this is where I think perhaps the difference might be is that if you sat that person down and, and asked them that, is it optional what it is that you're doing, right? Because if you're saying that it's, it's grounded in your belief, then the question becomes, is, is it optional? Did you have to do this? And I'm sure that a lot of those people will say, I don't, right? So, so he might God say, God makes you do this belief. Well, if your faith is grounded in this God, then you have no other option. You, you have, have no to other do, option because God to makes do you. It. You have to do it. So, mm-hmm. so, so, the, so you might ask the other person and then, and you, so you, oh, you should ask Tony, did you really have to do it? Right? And Tony might say, and yeah, and then you say, Tony, why? Why did you have, if you decide to walk away from this tomorrow, what, what is to stop you, right? Yeah, and I, yeah. I see where you're coming from. Yeah. And I think this is what concerns me. Okay. This is where I am. Sure. Okay. Is that I think there are all sorts of, people can do good things and people can do bad things and you can do good things for good reasons, and you could do good things for not as good reasons, right. Right? right? And what concerns me is, is that I'm worried that we could take scriptures from any religion, right. not just Christianity, right. and we could say, find scriptures, find a whole host of scriptures, right. Or passages in right. Quran or right. the Bible or right. whatever. And those scriptures could say, or those passages could say, this, these people need to treat these other people this way because right. it says so right. in this, in these passages, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it could be a very good thing, but it could also 
I would imagine you could find some passages in these books that could justify doing very poor things to your fellow human. Right. And that could be justified as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, at that point, we w would separate what we would follow and what we wouldn't follow. Yeah, well, I would say um, that, you know, it all comes down to what kind of God it is that, sh that you're following. And I think that the Christian God um, has... But is that, but the God you're following, we find that out from the scriptures. From the scriptures, right. that's right. Um, the scriptures are a way in which God has revealed himself to us. And when you look in God's divine revelation in scripture, and that is from Genesis to Revelation, at least the way that I read it, and fundamental to, to that, central to that, is God, at least the Christian scriptures, entering into the human condition through his son, Jesus Christ. This God has shown us that he is a God who takes um, the human condition very seriously. He's willing to enter into it, and he's willing to even suffer uh, with us. And so when we follow this God, then it means that we also have to be willing to care for and suffer with those who suffer. And that includes the marginalized, the poor, um, those, who are, those who are suffering, the widows, the orphans, and all of that stuff. And I think in that, um, you will find a difference there um, between what it is that I am articulating here, uh, because I don't know of any other religion out there that has their God enter into the human condition in the way in which uh, Christians are saying. So I think perhaps the approach that we would have when we... I guess what I'm thinking of is like when, like there are right. sects of Christianity and I think they're more, they're modern sects and I don't, right. I forgot what they're called. They're right. these wealth sects or, you know what I'm talking about? That, that preach, um, get as rich as you can and, right. and you right. know, so you can buy your cars right. And, right. and I don't know if that's part of the these sects use... Yeah, prosperity gospel. Yeah, 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 that's it, prosperity. About, yeah. And I'm assuming they're getting this from the scripture. Right, right. And right. if I want to know what's true, right. what's real, right. is there a way I could find that out? It seems like both messages are coming from yeah, that no, same I think, source. I think, I think the, the, um, you're putting your hand on, a, on a, something that's really difficult and complicated in terms of how we read scripture and how we interpret scripture. Um, obviously, and that's what these, I think I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 we can interpret so it's it. A, it's, a, it's, it's, it's uh, different people read scripture differently, yeah. and different people get out of scripture what, what it is that they, they want to get. I'm not sure that I completely agree with um, the prosperity gospel thing that you're saying. Because yeah, I would imagine you don't. I would one, imagine you yeah, don't. On the one hand, I do acknowledge as I've said to you uh, yeah. from in the beginning, that you do find in the scriptures the notion that wealth can be a blessing from God. But I think that if we're reading the scriptures very carefully and very faithfully, right. we will find that in addition to um, 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 those passages that say that blessings can be a wealth, uh, wealth can be a blessing from God, there are all of these dangers that tell us that these wealth can turn you away, um, can turn your heart away from God. Well, I think what so, Tony's point is, is that, yeah. is that he just says, yeah, I agree with you with the prosperity scriptures or the right, prosperity right, movement right. that you could read the scriptures and you could interpret them this way. Right. And then obviously you interpret right. them a very different right. way. And according to Tony, Tony says, I just, I have one central tenet, do unto others. And it seems to work for me. Right. And I don't. I need a God to 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 help the poor. Right. And I help the poor, right. and I form relationships with the poor. Right. And and it just. I'm, if I want to know what's true, right. what's real, right. And I want to follow a true belief. Right. If helping the poor is just the right thing to do because it's the right thing to right. do, and right. and do unto others, and to decrease human suffering. Mm -hmm then I'd like to do that. If helping the poor, the reason why uh, I should align myself with the poor is because of 
a God, then I want to do that. And if it's more a specific God, Jesus, then I would like to believe that. And I'm trying to see how I could distinguish between all those beliefs. Yeah. And I could, and I'm not going to, I think, I'm not going to argue against helping the poor. I guess we could. Uh, I could uh, street epistemology that, but I, I, I'm not going to. Right. And we'll just make that an assumption that right. that seems to be a good thing right. to do. Right. And but the reason to do it, mm-hmm. why to do it, why to do that, it, and, 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 exactly. And, and I understand why you say, yeah, yeah. And, and I know you believe it. Right. And I'm just as a as a dispassionate person, I'm wanting to believe true things. Right. I'd want to know the reason to do it, the yeah. the best reason to yeah. do it. So I so I've given you the Christian reason to do it, right? Which yeah. is that. Um, it, we haven't even talked about the cross yet, right? The cross is is the central uh, symbol of the Christian faith. And, and again, um, so when, for example, I encounter somebody who preaches the prosperity theology or prosperity gospel, I would ask them, where does the cross fit in this? <laughs> where does the cross fit in your theology? Because the cross uh, is... Um, the cross is is, is 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 amazing in that not only does it show us the depths uh, of God's willingness to enter into our suffering, but historically, you know, crucifixion was reserved for the poor, the underclass. Uh, and so the Philippian hymn talks about Jesus becoming a slave and then even to the point of death, to crucifixion, right? Again, right there, you're beginning to see the relationship between poverty, uh, his weakness, and this really important thing that I'm, I am I am pointing to, which is care for the poor. So for me, those two go together. That if if we're really serious about the cross, then you have to ask yourself, why is Jesus on the cross? He's entering into the depths of our suffering. He's entering into the depths of uh, human pain. And if we're going to follow this Jesus, then we ought to be willing to also walk with, journey with, and care for those like him, right? You know, when he says, I was in prison, you didn't come to visit me. I was sick, you didn't come to see me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Whatever you do to the least of these, you've done for me. What he's saying is, I took on the form of those who are suffering in the world. And so if you don't care for those who are suffering in your world, you don't care for me. That is Jesus. So for me, this is why I'm saying this is, this comes from belief in this God, this God who has revealed himself to us as someone who is willing to enter into the depths of human suffering. So you cannot follow this God yeah. and not care about the poor. Now, I'm not making a judgment about people who do not follow this God. That's not. That's not my job. Uh, That's the reason why you have the belief is because of exactly the, you personally. Exa- because of the kind of God I follow, right? He's yeah. not a watchmaker who just sets the, the 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 world in motion and redraws himself. He's not a God who is doesn't want to be bothered with human suffering. He's a God who is entered. Uh, right. What the fact that you you follow it because of this God? Right. What does it say about that God being true and real? What does it say about that God being true? I know why you follow it. Right. But you, the, the act of you following it, mm-hmm. how does that relate to that God being a true God as opposed to another God? Because I think that personally, I feel God's presence a lot when I'm with people who, and I would imagine someone who follows a law would could right. say the same thing. Well, I don't know. I don't know where they're coming from. Oh, you have okay. to talk to them okay. uh, to figure that out. But I feel God's presence when I'm in the company of these people who have been neglected and marginalized. And you know, so I was just talking to you but, before. But if we someone started, who follows a law right. feels the same thing, well, what, what does that have, say about the truth value? You're going to have to interrogate them. <laughs> you're going to have to interrogate them. Do we need to? Uh, I think so. Would they I, need to interrogate you? Sure. I'm more than happy to talk to them. Uh, I'm more than happy to. Again, it, it's creating what? hypotheticals. Could, could we is just take easy. it on face value that they believe their belief because of Allah? Oh, yes, of course. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that. Um, could we say then Allah is true? I don't know. What I can tell you is 
from my faith, right? I have never been a Muslim. Yeah. So you're going to have to interview the Muslim about their faith and mm-hmm. about, you know. But I can tell you God is true because I feel God's presence when I'm in uh, the company of people who have been marginalized and uh, and ostracized. When you when you and when if you someone go out said the same thing about Allah, that they feel they feel Allah's presence there. Yeah, and they, and they well, want to help people. That's fine. Then let me. Then let we can me, say both gods are true and both gods are driving the beliefs. That's not my position to say. I can I can I can only talk about the God that I have experienced. Does that make sense? You you're gonna have to talk to the person who believes in Allah, <laughs> right? Because I haven't so we're done saying, that. But, from your perspective, right. I would I would imagine you either think both gods are true or one god is true. It's not for me to judge. It's not, it's for, not for me. I can only speak from my perspective of the Christian God because that's the only God that I know and that's the only God that I've experienced. Is your and God, God true God for you? Very true for Or me. is it true for everybody? That God is very true for me. Okay, but not uh, true for everybody. Well, I think God exists. So to the extent that... Um, when I say tr- when you say true for everybody, do you mean that God does not exist? Jesus exists for everybody, true for everybody, whether they believe it or not. But but true in the sense that um, those who believe will experience Him differently than those who do not believe. Do you have to believe in your God for it to be true? For your God to be true, or is your God just true? My God is true, regardless. Yeah, and that's. And, I think um, that I, I assume that that's. Yeah, God what is you're true. Right? But what I'm saying is that that God will be experienced differently by those who follow Him and than those are, who don't. Can we say the same thing about Allah then? About that? Well, <clears throat> you're gonna have Allah to talk. Allah be experienced to, <clears throat> differently by people who follow Him and don't follow Him. Well, you're gonna have to talk to a Muslim for that. I cannot I cannot make a judgment for something I don't know or something I don't follow, right? So I think you're going to have to uh from where I stand, really? I would say that I would say that God is true and uh and we can't, but I we can't say, make the that same assumption for someone who follows Allah. Well, I haven't done I haven't followed Allah. So I, I don't know I don't I can't make I can't make that judgment. Interesting. What I will say is that um, Allah is different from the Christian God, right? Um, the the God, the Father of Jesus Christ, who has shown Himself to uh, to enter into into the case of 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 of, of human suffering. And I think the only yeah. assumption we're making is that right. the person who follows respective gods believe their respective gods are objectively true. Well, it's not it's not my position to judge. It's not. You know, I'm it's not, not saying. My job I'm not saying your position to judge right. someone right. else's god. Right. I'm saying just the premise that someone who follows Allah believes objectively that their God is true, and I might not believe in Allah, but I can see how someone who does objectively thinks that their God is true. I mean, believe that their God is true objectively. It's not my position to judge. Yeah, I can not judge all I can, all I can do is to faithfully follow the God that I believe is true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think and other think, people follow gods that they believe are true? Yes, I do. That's all I'm I saying, do. I think. I do. And yeah. it's not my position to judge them. And, and I, it's not and my I position to determine whether their God is true or not. My position is to say, if you've chosen to follow this God of Israel, yeah. and if you've chosen to follow this God faithfully, right. then, yeah, then you will experience this God in a in a unique way. Yeah. So um so yeah, I, I can't I can't make a judgment about somebody else's God that I haven't followed. Yeah. No, yeah. I I see yeah, yeah. And, and again, I don't think I'm asking you to make a judgment. Okay. I just to take the perspective of. Well, but it's it's easier to if it's easier to it's easier to try to take a perspective of <laughs> how could you t- how could I, for example, take a perspective of um, uh, of something that I've never walked, of, of, I've never been, or never. All you end up doing is objectifying uh, those people who have who have um, who, who have made put, who have made that journey. Put it this way, yeah. I I I yeah. believe mm-hmm. to my core right. that what you believe right. You believe it to your core. Right. And what you believe is absolutely true. But it's more than just belief, right? It's because belief can be something that is so passive 
right? Be- because of the way that you are saying, I believe to your, you, I believe that you believe to your core. But that doesn't mean anything because what counts is belief that is expressed in action, right? So belief without action, belief without living out and walking out that belief is no belief at all. Mm. So, um, this is why I could never walk in the shoes of a Muslim like you are asking me to do, because, uh, because that belief is more than just some kind of intellectual accent uh, or some kind of intellectual judgment. It is who they are. They get up every day and pray five times a day. I understand. Uh, they, they get up and, you know, and, yeah. and, and live out that belief. They practice Ramadan. Uh, I have not done that, right? So my belief informs who I am and it informs how I live and it informs. So it's more than just belief, right? If all we did was just belief, then, yeah. th- then we have nothing. It's belief that is at the core of your identity and that is expressed also uh, in your actions. And that's what I mean when I say I couldn't make a judgment about someone because I could never walk in, in their shoes. I have never expressed their belief in my actions. Yeah, I think I see where you're coming from. Right. I think I'm wondering if the more difficult we make it to walk in someone else's shoes, Mm -hmm. the more difficult it would be to explore another's beliefs. And then maybe it would be more difficult to find out if your own belief was incorrect, if it was incorrect. What do you think? But this is where relationship comes in, right? It's very important. Uh, And I actually think we're doing people of other faiths a disservice uh, to sit here and talk about them. This is why relationship is so important. You, we have to. These are people, and you have to get to know them. You have to get to talk to them. You have to get to probe them uh, the way that you're probing me, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's more than just a, a one-hour conversation. It's relationship, right? Where they you journey with them, get to know who they are, how their beliefs inform inform how they live, how how they do things. Um, if we want to sit and be sort of distant um, observers and say from where I sit, okay, I, I can make judgments about people who have other beliefs, we frankly don't know anything and we are not in a position to say that. Uh, we have to get to know them. And, and, and really, that's really what I've been saying that the Christian... Um, uh, the Christian faith is about a God who enters into our human condition, right, and and forms relationships with us. So, in that regard, we will need to form relationships with them uh, in order in order to even be able to say anything about what it is that they believe. Last question. Yes. If your belief happened to be incorrect, I'm not saying it is, but if it yeah. was incorrect, yeah, would you want to know it? Absolutely, because it would mean that. The God I think I know is not that God. If your belief was incorrect, I know yes. I said that was the last yes. question, but I guess yes. this will be. Yes. If your belief happened to be incorrect, how would we go about finding that out? Well, we will find that out by perhaps being in conversation with people uh, and being in relationship with people who believe differently. And the belief that I have articulated here is that the following the God of Israel necessitates and, and, and that God who has shown himself willing to enter into our human suffering through Jesus Christ the means mm-hmm. that we can be no other or do nothing else or, or be, be no other than people who care deeply right. about the poor. Right. So for me, if that belief is not true, then... That would mean that the God that I thought I knew was an entirely different God altogether. And I would want somebody to show me why the God, the Father of Israel, I mean, the God of Israel and God, the Father of Jesus Christ, is a God who is not concerned or caring about the poor. Um, Do you think you would stop helping poor yourself? Or do you think you would be the same person? I think it would... It would have, I think I would still help the poor, but the stakes won't be 
high for me in terms of when the going gets tough, you know, who is to say you shouldn't do it? And by stakes, meaning what stakes? Like what stakes meaning that you can, you can walk out. If you don't do it, what happens? You can walk out whenever you, you, you want to, whenever the going gets tough, right? That you can stop helping that can help the poor with no. But the stakes for Christianity, this has, as you see it, if you, if you're a Christian and you start help, stop helping the poor, right? what happens? Then it means you're not being true to your faith. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not really, um, you're not, yes, you're not, you're not following this God. I mean, you're not being. And and why is that bad? Because it just means you're not, you're not being serious about your faith. Right. I mean, if you're really serious about your faith. And if that person's not serious about their faith. Right. What are we concerned about just other than them not following their faith? Well, then perhaps they shouldn't call themselves Christian if you're not serious about your faith. Right. And if they still call themselves Christians and don't do this, what happens? Then I think I would, I would want to be in relationship with them. Um, I don't want to judge them. I would want to meet them, get to know them, and to show them that um, if you are serious about about your faith, if you are serious about following this God, then you should also care about. Do you, th- the do you poor. think God would punish someone for not doing this? Do I think God will punish them? I'm not God. <laughs> God deals with each of us, uh, yeah. each of us differently. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I don't. If you if you're asking me if this belief is is based on fear that God is going to punish me if I don't do it, the answer is no. Oh. Uh, it's a belief that's based on love and relationship. That I love God so much yeah. that I want to be like Him. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. love you know. Um, and as Paul tells us, you know, God is conforming us into the image of his son. Yeah. And if we are trying to be like Jesus, then we'll care about those that Jesus cared about. Right. Uh, and the people that Jesus cared about were those who were marginalized, those who were captive, as he says to us uh, in the Gospel of Luke uh, chapter 6. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. And sure. my apologies. Sometimes my, my Sometimes my questions can be kind of blunt. And sometimes I don't realize how blunt they are until... I look back at the conversation, you know, right, right. but, but, but during this conversation, I did realize during, while we're doing this, sometimes my questions are a little more on the blunt side. I do apologize for that. <laughs> oh no, that's but, fine. I can take anything. <laughs> I can take any questions. Yeah. It's really in the, in the, in the, in a good spirit yes, of really trying right. to understand what, how you're, right. how you're seeing the world and how exactly. you're coming to believe what you exactly. believe. And I really, exactly. and I really do appreciate that. Exactly. Can I make one final statement Please, about go this right ahead. that you can put in there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so if we were to summarize what I'm saying is, mm-hmm. it, it is that, um, if we are followers of this God of Israel who has revealed himself to us in scripture, then we would care about the poor. Uh, and also that, um, we will also reassess our relationship with material possessions. In other words, if we feed our desires for material possessions and wealth, we will starve our faith in this God of Israel or in this God, the Father of Jesus Christ. But I think if we also feed our faith uh, in this God, then I think we will end up eventually starving our desire for, for material possessions. 